is no exception. I urge all of you here this evening to make full use of the question and answer session that will happen later on tonight. With that said, I now ask you to join with me in welcoming Dr. Zakir Naik to address the society. Alhamdulillah. Was salatu was salam. Ala Rasulillah. Wa ala ali wa sahabi ajmain. Amma baad. Awuzu billahi min ashaytani rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim Ya ayyuhan nasu inna khalaqnaakum min zaqin wa unsa wa jalnaakum. Shu'ubaw wa qiba ila li ta'arafu. Inna qalmaku min dallahi atkaakum. Inna la alimun kabir. Rabbi shali sadri. Wa yisalli amri. Wa ahlul ugdata min lisani yafkahu kawli. Honorable Mr. President of the Oxford Union, Mr. James Langman, the Honorable Members of the Oxford Union, the respected elders, and my dear brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God, be on all of you. <coughs> It's an honor and a great pleasure for me to address this historic Oxford Union. And I would like to thank the Oxford Union, especially its president, Mr. James Langman, for making this event possible. The topic of my talk today is Islam and the 21st century. Islam comes from the root word salam, which means peace. It's also derived from the Arabic word film, which means to submit your will to Almighty God. Islam, in short, means peace acquired by submitting your will to Almighty God. And any person who submits his will to Almighty God, he is called as a Muslim. Many people have a misconception that Islam is a new religion which came into existence 1400 years ago and Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is the founder of this religion. In fact, Islam is there since time immemorial, since man set foot on this earth and Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is not the founder of this religion but he is the last and final messenger of Almighty God. The religion of Islam is based on the teachings of the glorious Quran which came into existence 1400 years back. Is it possible that today the humanity at large in this 21st century can gain guidance how a life to be led, how a life should be led from a book which is 1400 years ago, from a book which is 14 years old, but natural. The answer obviously is no, if this book is written by a human being. But the glorious Quran is the last and final revelation of Almighty God, which was revealed to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The glorious Quran is the proclamation to humanity. It is the fountain of mercy and wisdom. It's a guide to the erring. It's a warning to the heedless. It's an assurance to those in doubt. It's a solace to the suffering and it is an hope to those in despair. The glorious Quran is the last and final revelation of Almighty God which was revealed to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. For any book to claim that it is a word of God, for any book to prove that it is the revelation from Almighty God, it should stand the test of time. Previously in the olden days, it was the age of miracles. The glorious Quran is the miracle of miracles. Later on came the age of literature and poetry. Muslim and non-Muslim Arabic scholars alike, they acclaim the glorious Quran to be the best Arabic literature available on the face of the earth. But today, if a religious book in a very poetic fashion says 
the world is flat. Will a modern man believe in it? But naturally the answer is no. Because today is not the age of literature and poetry. Today is the age of science and technology. So let us analyze whether this glorious Quran is compatible or incompatible with modern science. According to Oxford, according to Albert Einstein, the famous physicist and the Nobel Prize winner, who I am told also addressed this historic Oxford Union, he said, science without religion is lame and religion without science is blind. Let me remind you, the glorious Quran is not a book of science, S-C-I-E-N-C-E, -E, but it's a book of signs, S-I-G-N-S. It's a book of ayats, it's a book of verses. And the glorious Quran has more than 6,000 signs, 6,000 ayats, 6,000 verses, out of which more than 1,000 speak about science. As far as my talk today is concerned, I will only be speaking about scientific facts. I will not be speaking about scientific hypotheses and theories, which all of us know many a times, these theories and hypotheses take U-turns. In the field of astronomy, a few decades earlier, in the 1970s, there were a group of scientists who described how the universe came into existence, for which they got the Nobel Prize. This they called as the Big Bang. And these scientists said that initially our universe was one primary nebula. Then there was a secondary separation, there was the Big Bang, which gave rise to galaxies, the stars, the planets, the sun, as well as the earth on which we live. This they called as the Big Bang. This, what the scientists discovered about 40 years back, is mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago, in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21. Verse number 30, where it says, Avalam yaral lazina kafiru. Do not the unbelievers see. Anna samawati wal arda. Kaan tarat faftak nahuma. That the heavens and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder. This big bang, which the scientists discovered recently, is mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago. Previously, we human beings, we thought that the world was flat. It was in 1577 when Sir Francis Drake sailed around the earth that he first time proved that the earth on which we live, it is spherical in shape. The Quran mentions 1400 years ago in Surah Naziyat, chapter number 79, verse number 30. Wal arda baada zalika dhaha. And thereafter, we have made the earth egg-shaped. One of the meaning of dha is an expanse and the earth is an expanse. The other meaning is derived from the Arabic word duya, which means an egg. And today we know the earth is not completely round like a ball. It is flattened from the pole. It is geospherical in shape. And if we analyze the Arabic word dahaha, doesn't refer to a normal egg. It specifically refers to the egg of an ostrich. And if we analyze the egg of an ostrich is too geospherical in shape. Imagine. The glorious Quran, 1400 years ago, says that the earth is geospherical in shape. Previously, we did not know that the light of the moon was its own light. Previously, we thought that the light of the moon was its own light. Recently, we have come to know that the light of the moon is not its own light, but it is a reflected and borrowed light. The Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 61, Blessed is he who has placed the constellation in the sky and placed the herin, sun, a lamp having its own light and moon having borrowed or reflected light. So the Quran describes the moonlight as borrowed or reflected, which we came to know recently in science. Recently in science means 50 years back, 100 years back, 200 years back. When I was in school, I passed my school in 1982, about 29 years back. There I'd learned in science that the sun, though it revolves, it does, not, it does not rotate about its own axis. But the Quran mentions in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 33, It is he who has created the night and the day. The sun and the moon. Each one traveling in orbit with its own motion. The Quran says the sun and the moon, besides revolving, it also rotates about its own axis. And today, recently, a few decades earlier, science has come to know 
that the sun rotates and takes about 25 days to complete one rotation, which has been incorporated in most of the school textbooks throughout the world. There may be certain skeptics who will say, it's nothing great that the Quran speaks about astronomy since the Arabs were advanced in the field of astronomy. I do agree that the Arabs were advanced in the field of astronomy, but I'd like to remind them that the Arabs became advanced in the field of astronomy a few hundred years after the Quran was revealed. So it is from the Quran that the Arabs learned about astronomy and not the vice versa. In the field of hydrology, in the field of hydrology, we learn in the school about the water cycle. How does the water evaporate from the ocean, forms into clouds, moves into interior, falls down as rain, and the water is replenished. This was first described by Sir Bernard Palissy in the year 1580. The Quran too describes the water cycle in great detail 1400 years ago. The Quran says the water evaporates from the ocean, forms into clouds, the clouds join, they move into the interior, they fall down as rain, and the water table is replenished and the water cycle is completed. The Quran speaks about the water cycle in great detail in several places. In Surah az zumur chapter number 39, verse number 21. In Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 24. In Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 18. In Surah Hijar, chapter number 15, verse number 22. In Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 43. In Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 24. In Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 57. In Surah Rod, chapter number 13, verse number 17. In Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 48 and 49. In Surah Fatir, chapter 35, verse number 9. In Surah Yasin, chapter number 36, verse number 34. In Surah Jasha, chapter number 45, verse number 5. In Surah Qaf, chapter number 50, verse number 8 and 9. In Surah Waqiyah, chapter number 56 verse number 68 to 70. In Surah Mulk, chapter 67, verse number 30. In Surah Tariq, chapter number 86, verse number 11. I can go on and on giving references only in the Quran of the several verses which speak about the water cycle in great detail. In the field of oceanography, there's a verse in the Quran, in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 53, which says that he has led two bodies of flowing water one sweet and palatable and the other salty and bitter. Though they meet, they do not mix. There is a barrier which is forbidden to be trespassed. Previously, we human beings knew that there are two types of water, sweet and salty. But the commentator of the Quran could not understand what does God Almighty mean by saying that these two waters, when they meet, they do not mix and there is a barrier which is forbidden to be trespassed. Today, after science has advanced, we have come to know that whenever one type of water flows into the other type of water, it loses its constituents and gets homogenized into the water it flows. This today science calls as the transitional homogenizing area, which the Quran refers to as barzakh, as a barrier. And this can be seen in Cape Point, the southernmost tip of South Africa. And when we see even the color of the water between these two types of water differs. And Professor Hay, a very famous oceanologist, he said that this information came to the human knowledge recently. This book, the Quran, it's difficult to explain how does it mention 40 years ago. In the field of biology, the Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30, that we have created every living thing from water. Will you not then believe? Imagine in the deserts of Arabia, the Quran says every living thing is made from water. Who could have believed in it? Today, after science has advanced, we have come to know that every living being, it contains cells. And the basic substance of cell is the cytoplasm, which contains about 80% water. Today, science tells us that every living creature contains 50 to 90% water. In the field of botany, previously we did not know that even the plants have got sexes male and female. The Quran says in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 53, that it is he who sends on water from the sky and with it brings diverse pairs of